All right. So thank you for that question. We're going to move to Elizabeth New, our Center for Worker Rights and Center for Healthcare Director. Thank you so much, Elizabeth, for joining us. And uh, the first thing we have to say is, yeah, yes, this is Elizabeth Hovde, but with a new last name. Isn't that right? It is. Yes. I got married a week ago. So new last name. It happens to be new, which is really convenient. Yeah. yeah new last name, but uh, same great content you are used to from her. So thanks for joining us. Um, I was recently looking back, uh, just incidentally, on results from some of the last votes that came through. And Washington citizens, I'd kind of forgotten about this. I think it was 2019. We'd voted on a Washington Cares-like program. I don't know if it was actually called Walk Cares in 2019 when that vote happened, or but it was a similar kind of long-term care tax, if I'm recalling this correctly. It was, it was pretty overwhelmingly rejected, th- this kind of idea has been. But since it's been passed by the legislature, it's been delayed. People are uh, had opted out in massive numbers. People aren't opting in when they had the chance. And problems have been highlighted right and left. But now there was a recent bill that passed that adds portability. And so now the state's person pushing an advertising campaign saying that, hey, it's, everything's fixed. You've got nothing to worry about. Do people still have something to worry about? They do. This is not a sure thing. And we'll go into that. But you're right about the um, vote. It was in 2019. It was an advisory vote, which, you know, uh, don't have any grounding. They just advise the legislature whether they should keep or not keep a law they've passed. It was advisory vote 20. Um, It was a non-binding question concerning whether to maintain or repeal House Bill 1087. That is the bill that created the Walk Cares Fund and the payroll tax to supply money to it. Um, Anyway, almost, let's see, I think it was 63% of voters voted in favor of repealing that bill. Of course, they did not repeal that bill and there have been efforts to repeal that bill even all along the way of finding out that this is not going to be Um, the way to fix a coming long-term care crisis in Washington state. You know, part of me thinks enough lawmakers have to know by now that this is not going to help in the way they intended when they voted this in. So I think it'd be interesting to give them a chance to repeal this. And heck, voters might save the day come November. We'll, We'll get to that too, but... Um, as far as the program's many flaws, one of them is that if you move out of state, you lose uh, the possibility of a WAW CARES benefit. Um, so that's one of the problems. And it, it was a, it was one of, the, one of the things people like least about this. So lawmakers this session, for the first time after hearing this for years, decided to fix that part of the problem, kind of, sort of. It allows workers who move out of state eventually to continue their walk hairs tax withdrawals in their new jobs in new states and earn that vestment criteria number of years they need to benefit from the program. So it does allow people to carry on with participation in the program if they keep paying in for the required number of years. Um, They will also have an opportunity to opt out if they move out of the state. Uh, But then, of course, they would not see a benefit and they would just lose the money they'd put into the program so far. And as I wrote in a blog, people who want to take their walk cares dollars out of state still need very they need to meet various other criteria one is you need to need long-term care right some of us won't a lot of us will some of us won't but we're paying for it anyway and in many cases it's low-income workers who are going to pay for the long-term care needs of people with more resources and that's just backward that's been the basic problem with this one of the many problems with this program all along the way um so what else was I going to tell you about? The other thing is investment criteria. Like I said, you have to keep paying into it to meet investment criteria and criterion of um, 10 years paying in out of your working years without a break of five or more years. Now, this vestment criteria I've criticized and hoped 
the lawmakers get around changing as it will rule out some of the very people this law is said to help, which is caregivers. You know, a, a, a parent could care for their kids during their uh, needing to be cared for years. They could go back to work a little bit, care for another kid, um, elderly parents that need care eventually. This is going to rule people out. Another thing that's going to rule people out of the investment criteria is people who work less than 500 hours a year. It's very part-time, but you need to work more than 500 hours a year for it to count as an eligibility year. And if this program is some kind of safety net, which I don't think it is, I think it's a safety net that supplies people who are not in need with money. Um, but if it is, you're, you're ruling out a lot of people who are in need of government safety nets. So th the other thing that's interesting about this 500 year requirement is there was a bill that would take um, suggestions from long-term care supports and services trust commission to make wall cares bear better. One of them was portability. Another thing was changing. They said that to have portability, we needed to change the eligibility requirement for the hours worked in a year from 500 to 1,000, double it. So it's interesting that this bill that passed, 2467, does not contain that change. So I think it's going to need to be amended again. Um, I also think WACARE's solvency problems are going to grow. You've just created a big layer of administration, extra layer of administration for this fund. So those well, are some I, I feel really relaxed and assured that this program is going to be fine just because they added portability after hearing all that. They fixed one thing. I'm, I'm relaxed. Uh, as, as a technical question before I get to a question from the Q&A uh, check, I just wanted to see with this uh, portability change, I know at one point we weren't sure if it looked like it was going to go directly to the signing desk of Inslee or if it was going to show up as an alternate to the ballot initiative that would make the program voluntary. Do we have any further clarity on, on what the state will be for that? You know, House Bill 2467, which is what we're talking about, was delivered to the governor on March 4. It was signed on March 15. And the bill information says that the new law is effective June 6. Okay. In all session, I kept asking legislature, legislators and asking uh, legal advice about whether this portability legislation or another bill that dealt with portability plus the 500 hours thing, plus making some voluntary exemptions, not voluntary, another tweak that's a huge mess. In any case, um, no one knew. Lawmakers didn't know uh, their legal uh, contacts did not know. Um, there was a thought that an outside group could use this bill as a possible um, alternative to Initiative 2124, which would make WACARES optional, as some people know, that's on the ballot in November. But I don't think it can or will be, especially now that the legislature is over, um, because the lawmakers did not consider it, discuss it, come up with an alternative. I think that means that it goes to the ballot unmatched by another alternative, but I'm not a legal expert and it will right. be interesting to say, but to see, but I don't think it will be. And so, if any bill was going to be, it would have been the other bill. The other bill actually handled a lot of the things that are wrong with WACARES, not all of them. The very core of this thing is busted. You're charging yeah. low-income workers, people in need to pay for long-term care, people not in need. It's bizarre. But um, in any case, yeah, I don't think it will be. Okay. So let me, uh, a, a clarifying question on the portability aspect. So companies in different states have to withhold and remit Washington's payroll taxes. Is that how that works then? I believe the worker will file uh, their earnings with the state and they will be sending a check from themselves to the state. So you you are responsible essentially to take the, the portion out of your own paycheck then? Yeah, th there is a huge administrative burden on workers who choose this portability. 
which probably means most of them will opt out, which is what the state probably wants them to do to maintain mm -hmm. solvency uh, of the program. But it, like I said, it creates a huge layer for anybody who takes them up on the offer. That's a huge administrative arm they're going to need. And already we see with this walk care is uh, optional initiative. On one hand, it's great to give people a choice about how they're going to finance possible needs in their life. On the other hand, you're creating a solvency issue that's even deeper. You know, you're requiring a, a huge administrative oversight about who's opting in, who's opting out, if they're eligible, if they're not. It's going to be a, it's going to be costly. So the, the and what I thought, point. what I thought, what I thought they should do is consider 2124, realize that this is going to be a more costly program with people opting out that they don't want to be on the hook for and repeal the thing outright. Yeah. Yeah. No, well, and that I think that would have been the, the best alternative for, for us all. I mean, it's funny when we're talking about uh, you know, taking your own payments out and the administrative burden that is, I think there's also just the reality of people seeing the money and having to hand in the check themselves without it automatically being deducted and seeing that and being like, is this even worth it? You know what I'm paying for? Kind of kind of why I wish how we uh, would do with our income taxes a little bit, you know, right, right in our checks directly there. But um, so the, the arguments of proponents of Washington Cares would say that if we remove Washington Cares, if we make it voluntary, if you know, as you're saying, it should have been gutted altogether. If we follow that path, then nobody gets to feel assured. So even if there are some problems, um, the with with even with portability, and you're saying that you know some people won't qualify. Well, without this, nobody would have long-term care needs covered. Is that even true, though? No. <laughs> okay. Uh Next question. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is what's we're going to see a lot of this between now and November. Taking away walk cares is going to bankrupt seniors. It's going to put them in poverty. It's going to make them die cold and alone. The reality is taxpayers already fund a safety net for long term care needs. It's called Medicaid. Now, people also make themselves look poor so they can qualify for Medicaid and shift their long-term care cost needs onto taxpayers. What lawmakers should be doing is strengthening and reforming Medicaid so we can save real money. You know, that, that's what WalkCares was created to do, was save the state money to give workers, uh, family caregivers, money paid by taxpayers rather than handled by families and their own assets and things like that. So no, this, this, this initiative doesn't change any of that. If you are going to be a person in need of long-term care, you're still going to be in need and you will qualify for Medicaid long-term care because you're impoverished. Um, it doesn't force anyone out. And it opens up opportunities for uh, all the people who know now that this is a very possible need to invest their money in ways or save their money in ways that can provide long-term care for them in way better ways than while care is good. Real estate could do better. Various investments will do better. Taking family money, if that's available, will do better. There are many ways to save and invest in long-term care. And if you don't need long-term care, then you've saved and invested for life needs in general. Yeah. So I can't even remember where this question started, but it is hilarious <laughs> to see lawmakers and union leaders saying, if we take this initiative away, people are going to be dying alone and they're going to have to impoverish themselves. The reality is some people choose to impoverish themselves so they can make Medicaid pay for their long-term care and pass on their assets or savings to their children. So um, we need to fix what's wrong. That's Medicaid abuse. It is not creating a new program that some people will benefit from, some people won't. And that, you know, for the people in true need that are going to need Medicaid someday, two things. One thing, $36,500 is going to run out quick. They're going to be on Medicaid still. Secondly, they're people in need without investments and assets and savings and planning. 
they're now paying a portion of their income and they'll still be on Medicaid someday. This, this is not a safety net program. This is not compassionate. That's exactly right. Well, we've got just a little bit of, la- uh, of time left here, and I wanted to switch gears really quickly because you also recently wrote about one of, in my opinion, the worst bills from the session that would have allowed striking workers to apply for unemployment benefits. So it it did not pass, I believe, and but it sounds like there's movement to resurrect it in the future. What what are the what are you hearing on that? You know, the bills proposing this did die, much to the disappointment of labor unions who pledged the legislation will be back. And I believe them. There's a national effort trying to put tax paying employers on the hook for wages to employees when they refuse to work. It's bizarre. Um, At least two states are doing this right now on the East Coast. What's also interesting is how many lawmakers are willing to co-sponsor this legislation. I'm hopeful that they just didn't read it. And they said yes to co-sponsoring, thinking this was great for their politics and getting money from donors. There were 51 co-sponsors on the House bill. There were 21 on the Senate bill. Um, And it did not end up passing, even with amendments that would limit the number of weeks that a striking worker could collect unemployment insurance benefits and with an amendment that would send the cost to employers with striking workers instead of putting it on the socialized fund that funds the program uh, where all employers are paying in. So that was somewhat good news, but the the promise that it will be back is unfortunate. And, um, you know, it will definitely be resurrected. I could see more amendments that have to do with limiting the the number of weeks. and I hope, again, it will not pass and we will understand that this puts our unemployment insurance system at risk and even worse, it it tells employees that they don't have to work and still collect a paycheck. There's no reason to negotiate labor with their employer who is giving them work. You know, employment is a two way street. We have a contract together to do work for a certain price and to complete it. Um, And they provide, employers provide the wages to do that. So I think that this gives an unfair hand to labor um, and it will increase more strikes if the the thing passes. You know, the universe, the the universe, the um, United States Bureau of Labor Statistics shows that uh, work um, labor stoppages, which are strikes or lockouts, are way up. You know, they're up, and I don't think this is going to help slow them down. Yeah, well, and I would I would argue that strikes like that disproportionately usually impact uh, lower income to middle income people down the line. In the short term, it might seem like that collective of workers, maybe they get some sort of negotiation of a higher bump, but what ends up happening is that raises prices for everyone, and that generally bumps up the burden on lower people. So uh, lower income people. Um, So yeah, that's, that's one of the unfortunate side effects. Well, thank you so much, Elizabeth. We're just out of time. So uh, we could keep talking about this stuff forever, I'm sure, but uh, we'll cut it off here. Thanks so much for hosting today. Absolutely. Well, thank you guys for listening in and joining us this week. As a reminder, this happens every other week. And if you want to keep up with our work, WashingtonPolicy.org is the place. And we have our weekly newsletter that you can sign up for. It's free, has tons of great resources, highly recommend and share that with friends. And we'll see you on the next one.